Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julie Trebo. I'm the Artist at Risk Connection Director at PEN America. And I would like to welcome all of you uh, to this program, the challenge of Me Too and the Morally Compromised Artist, a panel discussion with Svetlana Mincheva. Uh, Svetlana is the Director of Program at the National Coalition Against Censorship. Um, we have Pamela Schneen, who is a New York-based poet, writer, and performer, and Judith Schulewitz, who is critique, journalist, and a writer. Um, this discussion is led by my colleague, um, John Friedman, who is the Campus uh, Free Speech Director here at Penn. Um, so today's discussion will uh, look at challenges raised by the Me Too movement regarding exhibi exhibiting, publishing, and performing works created by morally compromised artists and writers. Just a few words about the organization I represent. Uh, PEN America was founded by, write, by writers sorry, and for writers uh, to celebrate the power of the written word and to defend free expression in the US and around the world. Uh, the project that I'm leading at PEN aims to safeguard the right to artistic freedom and ensure that artists everywhere can live and work without fear. So as you can imagine, uh, since the Me Too movement spread virally more than a year ago, it has raised numerous questions among creative thinker, curator, teacher, editor, and publisher. Um, disgraced actor Bill Cosby has been found guilty of sexual assault. However, the Cosby show remained a foundational moment in the history of presenting African-American family on TV. It was massively important for popular culture. Chuck Close has been accused of sexual misconduct, along with dozens of well-known artists and creative professionals. But their work remains a part of art curriculum and of major museum collection. So how do we cone with their work and the work of creative throughout history who had violent and contentious personal lives? Should their action affect how we see their work? Should it color our reasons for engaging with it? So these questions are the one that we are asking, you know, today our panelists. Question about power, spectatorship, violence, gender, labor, and media consumption. We started this conversation at the Brooklyn Book Festival last year with a panel discussion looking at the complex history of polit and politics of the art of the accused. So today's event is a sequel to this full event where we aim to spur greater reflection for the implication for the world of college art. First and foremost, I would like to thank the entire team of the CAA annual conference and our partner for this event, the National Coalition Against Censorship for making this event possible. I also would like to thank the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts for their generous support. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to invite all of you to attend two ID Exchange Roundtable that we are organizing at the conference. One is tomorrow at 12.30, and we, we have Do Save Space Regime Strengthen Provocative Curricula. And on Friday at 2 p.m., harassment as censorship, defending artistic freedom online. Um, so on the house cleaning, please turn off anything that beeps or ring, but don't be shy. You can tweet and use the hashtag of the CAA conference, which is CAA 2019. Um, given the time constraint of this panel, I would like to invite all of you to write your question on a note card and my colleague will, will come to pick, them up, to pick them up. So now let me introduce our distinguished speakers. I'll start with Judith. Uh, so Judith is a critique, journalist, and author of The Sabbath World, Glimpse of a Different Order of Time. She has been a columnist of, at the New York Times Book Review, Slate, The New Republic, 
and New York Magazine, and contributed articles and essays to many other publications, including The Atlantic and The New Yorker. Judith was the editor of Lingua Franca, deputy editor of The New York Magazine, and science editor of The New Republic. Pamela. Pamela is New York-based poet, writer, and performer. She has been featured in numerous magazines, has hosted queer art film at IF, IF, uh, sorry, IFC in New York City, and she's the author of Sweet Dreams, Imagine Being More Afraid of Freedom Than Slavery, Gong and Other Words, Chap Book Lincoln, and The Chaplet Gift. She has performed in several museums in the country and around the world. She taught at the Sarah Lawrence College as a guest faculty member and is an online lecturer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, teaching the courses of human rights and art and writing art. Then we have Svendlana Mincheva, who is the director of the national director of program of the National Coalition Against Censorship. She has written an emerging on emerging trends in censorship, organized public discussion, and mobilized support for individual artists. She is the co-editor of Censoring Culture: Contemporary Threats to Free Expression. And finally, our moderator, John Friedman. He's the project director for Campus Speech at Penn. He managed uh, Penn America effort to defend free expression on college campuses, and is working on a new report coming out next month, which, which will be the first comprehensive treatment of the effects of President Trump's div divisive rhetoric on higher education. So have a look at our website soon. Uh, later this year, uh, Pen America will be launching a new signature online resource which will house guidance and best practices for students, faculty, senior leaders, and staff contributing major controversies over free speech and inclusion on college campuses. So thank you. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to jump right into um, what has been uh, a, a debate that has been going on for a number of years now. And each of us comes to this debate thinking about, I think, different issues in it from our own position. Now, each of you has um, works in a di slightly different line of work uh, that touches upon the art and artistic world. So just how do you um, think about this question at the, at the center of, of this panel today? about separating the creative products of an artist uh, from their personal conduct. Is it possible to imagine the two separate from one another, or are they inextricably uh, interlinked? And can you talk a little bit about um, some of the considerations that have informed how you respond to this question? We'll start with, with Judith and move this way. Uh, okay. Um, so this is a phrase, how do we separate the artist from the art? The dancer from the dance, of course, comes from the Yeats poem. but. Um, the question that keeps being asked is, is the former one. Um, and I think uh, there is a lot of uh, straw man, uh, straw manning, if we can say. There's constructions of straw men uh, that, that are attacked. Um, there's, there's, to give an incredibly rough outline of sort of a few different critical positions that get taken. There's the new critical position, which is that the, you know, the work of art is unto itself and should be read, divorced from all outside uh, influences. I find that in teaching literature to be very useful for forcing freshmen to actually focus on the text, um, but otherwise a critical model that's uh, not really realistic. There's the postmodern model in which, uh, the, or the reader reception model, in which the work of art is an interaction between text and reader or, or viewer, um, and uh, you know, intent, the intention of the author is irrelevant. And then there's the sort of new historicist position. I hope I'm not getting too academic for everybody. No, that's good. This is, there's the new historicist position, which says the work of art is an artifact of you know, it, the, a historical moment. All of these are unbelievably crude characterizations. I apologize. And then there's what I think of as reading in the real world, which is a mix of all of these, right? 
Uh, it's a product of history. It's a product of the interaction of the text. As a pro uh, what the text is is sort of a fleeting moment uh, in interacting with the viewer or the reader. And it is a thing unto itself. And biography absolutely does factor into it. So we can never not be affected by who the person is who produced it. There's a, a very brilliant novel by Siri Hustvet uh, called The Blazing World about a middle-aged artist who decides after um, an art career that was aborted by her marrying uh, a famous gallery owner. And it was aborted because suddenly everything she made was viewed through the lens of, oh, it was put out, you know, it was hung because it was shown because she's married to this powerful guy. So she sort of silenced herself. He died. She tried to go back to it. And she decided she was going to show the work. Uh, it was going to be a daring performative work uh, in which she would show work uh, and attribute it to three different young men and uh, serially. And um, you see how work is received differently depending on who the artist is perceived to be. Um, so I, I don't think it's possible to separate the dancer from the dance. And I think the question is just um, what are we going to decide is uh, acceptable and unacceptable? Are we going to decide that the immoral behavior of an artist is going to render the work unacceptable? Are we going to make that our top critical criterion or not? And I think that's the question. Yeah. Sorry to go on. Okay. Um, I, I think it's interesting to look at it in terms of models, but, you know, in terms of trying to think about, like, this idea, and I, I really don't like the title The Dancer from the Dance because of the fact that, that still it, it evokes something, like, kind of, like, romantic, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think we're talking about violence. Um, and so in that regard, uh, and even though dance can be complicated and it can be violent and all of that, I just, I find that, that title to be a little bit problematic. Um, but I, I sort of want to look at it, I would like to look at this in terms of uh, a case by case basis, because I think about it in terms of like pathology and, um, and then I'm like, well, it depends on the level of sickness, right? Um, so it's just sort of like if we're talking about, you know, somebody who's, you know, I don't know, a routine child molester, you know, as opposed to somebody who, you know, uh, whatever, made a mistake, you know, a long time ago and maybe, you know, and I mean, again, that starts to get into measurement and who's doing the measurement and all of this becomes very complicated. But um, some of the things that are coming up for me is one, um, as a black woman, um, you know, basically throughout school, you know, and certainly like high school, I was presented with all these kind of like racist classics. Right, and um, you know, Huckleberry Finn and stuff like that, you know, and it was like my nigger Jim and my nigger this and my nigger. And, um, and I think Faulkner, you know, is like my nigger. And, and you know, there was no trigger warning. Um, no one ever spoke to that. And there were a lot of classics I couldn't read because I remember that they affected me so much, right? Um, and no one spoke to that. I was just supposed to kind of go along with it. And still, to this day, no one speaks to that, right? So I think that it's interesting with regard to sexual abuse or the Me Too movement that suddenly that people are paying attention, but there's no kind of analysis in terms of race and racial offense. I mean, I think even in like the, the art world, it's just sort of like, well, they called them, you know, my negress, you know, <laughs> um, and basically that's fine, or you have, you know, a lot of the, the masters, you know, created caricatures of black people, black women, and, you know, and it's kind of like they're still accepted as masters, right? So that there's some kind of, like, discrepancy between race and, and sex, right, or race and gender. Um, I'm interested in... Uh, Thinking about one, like, you know, with Bill Cosby, um, there's something about, like, the system of celebrity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I have to, like, look at that with regard to analyzing some of this, whether somebody's a celebrity or they're not. Um, and I really feel that, that when they are celebrities, that we become accountable in a certain way, um, that, that there is this cannibalistic, you know, oh, we want your art, we want your art, we want your art, we're putting you on this pedestal, you are, you know... Um, you are God, and then these guys abuse that power, and then it's like, well, wait a minute, you've abused your power, how dare you? And so somehow there, there has to be, 
that has to be factored in. Um, so I'm interested in the system of celebrity. I'm also not so interested in like looking at this as the morally compromised artist. I'm interested in the system of patriarchy and, um, and basically how patriarchy and how capitalism sort of like has created this, this uh, gender um, imbalance um, has, has basically is a violence toward women intrinsically um, that it destroys it destroys all genders, um, and that basically, as long as we're we're uh, working within that system, there's going to be tons and tons and tons of corruption. And so, on a certain level, it's interesting to look at you know individual cases, but I think it all that it does become a situation of like a very medieval kind of like uh, punishment, and we're all judging and all of that, but we're not looking at the ways that we're all implicated in a system of patriarchy. It's a different dance. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. Um I'm glad you open it up to context because when we're talking about the dancer and the dance um, and that relationship, who does it implicate? And um, Judith was talking about you know, sort of the critical theory background. There's also this idea of the imagined author. And when you're looking at a piece of art, when you're reading a book, you're always imagining an author. You don't know the author. You can't really access the author in their entirety. You cannot even access the person you're talking to in their entirety, but you're imagining somebody. And what you know about that somebody affects how you read the work. Uh, that's in, in my, my favorite story in that vein is uh, Borges's story about Louis, Man, Louis Menand, the author of the Quixote. And Menand writes a Quixote, Don Quixote, which is verbatim the, sep, the same text as the Don Quixote, but it was written in the early 20th century. And it was an entirely different text because the words are the same but what you're imagining the author to be, you know, who would be the author that would write the Don Quixote, you know, between the wars? Uh, so that is, that is important. Um, but then, uh, but, uh, so it does implicate the work, but, uh, you know, kind of with, in my work, I have to do kind of be very pragmatic, and you're talking about the, the individual here, and we've had a lot of cases recently where work is taken down, books are not published, because, or books are not taught in schools because of the, uh, what the author, the real person of the author has done. And that's where context comes in, because to me, it's not just about reader and, uh, and author and implied author, it is also about the culture at large. And the way I see art is as something that belongs not to a particular individual, I mean, in our sort of individualistic capitalist economy, yes, this is like the art of the individual, but it's a cultural tradition. No art comes up over from an individual. No art is completely original. So we have a cultural tradition here. We have works that, are, uh, that uh, belong in a way to all of us. So kind of, I think in penal, and no individual should not be responsible for what they do. So we could penalize the artists. They're not above critique. But in, uh, in removing the work, you're also affecting the audience. You're penalizing the audience because, you know, there was the recent cancellation at the Museo del Barrio of uh, the Alejandro Jodorowsky retrospective because of something that he said in 1970, which then he retracted. And, you know, he's a controversial figure, unquestionably, I'd like to go and see those films and discuss and make up my mind and you know not endorse him, but um, uh, why am I deprived of that uh, chance? Why am I, you know, Roman Polanski, you know, horrible stuff, uh, criminally convicted. I love repulsion, you know, should I be deprived of seeing repulsion? It is not about penalizing the artist, it is about penalizing me uh, because this is the culture we share. These are, uh, this is the culture that's kind of around us. So, um, so that's, and then, you know, uh, w when you see the swap of accusations, where do you stop? And it's not, it's not just about rapists and child rapists. It's also about people that, you know, 20 years ago uh, were on a, there's an article, was in a talk show with a neo-Nazi. There are people that, you know, have done bad things as individuals, but whose art is interesting to discuss, whose art is valuable in way, one way or another. Not pure, but 
valuable. So that's kind of how I want to think about that in a general context of the culture. Um, it's it's clear that we're all you know we when we start to think about these questions we we bringing so much into the conversation right that has been been going on and and even among your comments um, there's a lot to unpack it, it, there's a lot of different ways we might go what I, what I'm thinking about is. Um, this question of like the canon, right? Mm -hmm. Pamela, you spoke about like a system of celebrity. Um, um, uh, Svetlana, you spoke about thinking about um, um, this, this inability, right? This question of, of depriving people who might want uh, to see something. Um, you know, it, it stands to some extent in opposition with the idea of, um, Pamela, you said, you talked about, you know, your experiences of, of you called it the problem of, of racist classics, right? So mm -hmm. on one hand, we have these, these classics, which we know may, may be, you know, deeply offensive. Right, um, um, uh, for some audiences, and then we're we're sort of caught between when we wrestle with the question of the canon of of um, how do we wrestle with this situation and what do we what do we do with it? Right, so so one of the biggest challenges I think that has come out of um, the Me Too movement and you know in general call culture is this question of you know is this a form of censorship? Right, that we should be opposed to that 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 you know we we would we would want the crimes of these individuals to be Called out in the public sphere, but we want to be, cons you know, but but there may be a limit um, um, uh, to to uh, what we might do with with the art that they have produced. So maybe if each of you could discuss, you know, does this assess does does the current moment concern you? Are you alarmed by calls to, you know, you mentioned uh, Jodorowsky taking out uh, the art from the El Barrio. We have other examples of art being taken away. Or is this, you know, the proper reckoning with, with racist or sexist classics or racist or sexist individuals? Well, first of all, there's a, there's a discrepancy between how race is treated and how gender is being treated. Because again, like, you know, no one really cares. I mean, again, I've never gotten any trigger warning about like racist text. It's kind of accepted. Um, but I was also thinking about like this being an era of, of trials. Right, that that you know that basically that every hour, every era of of America is sort of like we're we're um, I don't know we're we're invested in trials, public trials, and um, and that concerns me, right. Um, and the, the spectacle, the spectator nature and the participa participatory nature of it, you know, the kind of um, arena um, in that we're all, you know, called to be judges and who has the right to judge and who has the right um, to measure. But there was something else at the core of what you were saying. What did, what? Well, well, so let's take a with that, that question about, you know, a tr an era of trials, you know, that's not at odds with how We've historically talked about, you know, maybe the marketplace ideas, the marketplace of ideas, or you know, a capitalist society where people can vote with their feet uh, right. uh, or vote with their wallet is more like it. But you know, it, it, you know, is that at odds with some of the tensions that we're hearing here? Well, I don't agree with censorship per se, and I think that that's always a problem. Like, I feel like um, you know, we should have discussion around the work that there should be, you know, that definitely we should talk about it. But once you start to take things away, I worry about that. But then there is something. Interesting Interesting, like with the Dana Schutz, you know, kind of painting at the Whitney, and um, and she did Emmett Till, and um, and you know the whole of like there was some protest by some black artists around it, and um, and they were saying destroy the painting, which I took as very rhetorical, you know, um, I didn't see it as literal, but it was interesting that the entire like world kind of came out to like you know say to these black artists you mustn't you mustn't censor her, right? And so, so, and it was very condescending as if they hadn't like kind of thought about it as if they hadn't been, you know, black artists in the world. No one really even listened to what they were saying and that there's a kind of intrinsic censorship that happens to black artists in print that happens, you know, in the galleries, you know, that we don't even, we don't even get there, you know, to have our work critiqued, you know what I'm saying? So there's an intrinsic um, censorship in the system. But the bottom line is, is that like, say with Dana Schutz, you know, I felt like uh, a lot of it was uh, entitlement, right? And everyone was protecting this woman's entitlement, right? You know, like um, they were saying, well, you know, she just, you know, she identified as a mother and whatever. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, if I decided to kind of like take out, you know, to, to write about one of the most seminal events in like Jewish history, you know, then I like, 
I mean, I would be accountable for that. People would be like, well, you know, it's like she didn't paint somebody on the street. You know, it was like it was the the um, the event that kind of kicked off the civil rights movement. You know what I'm saying? So, so um, I was interested in still how everything became about her entitlement, her like don't censor her. You know, but there was no discussion about what happened to black artists in that. So I, I just wanted to say that. But I, I am against uh, censorship, you know, because I don't know where we stop and I don't know where we begin. Can I, 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 I'd like yeah. to respond a little to the Danish shows, but first I want to say how strongly I agree with that uh, the kind of the court of public opinion and public outrage, especially in the age of the internet and very the quick endorphin rush that you get from signing a petition to remove something and where public opinion is easily manipulated as we know <laughs> from the last election uh, and where allegations are sometimes enough to make somebody guilty, where innocent until proven guilty is not quite a standard. So it is you know, making this court of public outrage, putting it into cultural practice I find potentially extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, as to the Danish shoots, I, I think it's good be good to keep the conversation around the sort of the, the sins of the individual, not like the, the work itself, because we're going in a different direction. And I wanted to ask you what you thought about after the Emmett Till controversy, uh, which it wasn't, you know, about like they were saying the museum should not censor her because it was their decision. But after the Emmett Till controversy, there was a group of artists that were protesting uh, a Danish Schutz retrospective at ICA Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, and that retrospective was not even going to include the Emmett Till um, uh, painting. But the artists that were, uh, artists, activists that were protesting it saying, this artist that has done this misstep, she should not be given any platform. It, not, it wasn't about the work, it was about the artist being. And we've had like, other artists, uh, you know, women artists being accused of racism, saying like, no, no work of theirs should be shown anywhere. And that's where it becomes less not about the work, uh, which we can debate, but about the artist's personality and blacklisting the artist. Um, well, I mean, you know, I don't know about that. Um, I mean, there are lots of different individuals that are that sort of like are the protesters. So I think some protests are more effective than others. Um, and are, yeah, are certainly more important. Um, hmm, there's but something else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but do you think she should have been deplatformed by ICA Boston for her doing the Emmett Till painting at the Whitney? Uh, well, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't, I didn't know about that particular one, um, but I don't necessarily know if it's the same individuals that protested no, at the Whitney. No, there were Right. So I, I can't really, I can't really say, but I also think that there needs to be, um, that there needs to be accountability, um, and like figuring out how artists become accountable. Um, and then again, how do we hold you know perpetrators accountable? What does that what does that look like in a failed justice system, right? So on a certain level, you know, I mean, you know, with the R. Kelly thing, I was like, well, I want to see this in the courts, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, but our courts have failed us, right? That they've certainly failed, you know, people of color. Um, and so in that regard, um, where like what is a justice model? Um, where could we achieve justice? How do we hold people accountable? Um, those are all questions for me. Um, and I don't know, I don't know the answer, but then, you know, but sometimes I feel like, sometimes I feel, you know, really, I'm ambivalent, you know, because somebody does something and I think, you know, hang him, kill him, go, go get him, you know what I mean? I don't care if he dies a million times, you know I, what I mean? I can feel and, all that with a tweet, right, really. Right, like, right, and then on the other hand, like, you know, there are times sort of like, you know, I feel really uncomfortable. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, a forensic specialist, you know what I mean? I'm not in the court, I'm like, how, how would I, you know, how am I supposed to measure this, right? So where do, where does some of this um, belong, you know? Um, and, and then something about Dana Schultz, like I don't feel, um, I don't know. I mean, the, the idea of her being a victim all the time and like that her, her rights have to be protected bothers me. I, th I think also about like those longer term questions where 
you may have seen in the news, you know, someone is accused of something, you develop, you know, you're not sure how to feel about it, maybe you decide to join in an, in an outrage campaign or calling for something to be removed, but then you may not continue to necessarily follow the story. Years later, there were a series of developments, the person has been absolved of the allegations, but you still have a, a kind of residual feeling about the art. I mean, Judith, do you have any thoughts here? Um, well, so, yes, I mean, I, the, the, the classic example here would be Juno Diaz right, who was accused of uh, forcibly kissing, um, uh, I believe, a protege of his or a student, um, and uh, was removed from the chairmanship of the Pulitzer board while he was investigated. Uh, there were book bookstores that pulled his books from the shelves. Um, presumably, when I got very interested in this question, I talked to some, but some people in publishing who were involved in his work, uh, his work was probably not assigned, his speaking engagements, and I don't know how many of you are writers, but that's how writers make a lot of their money, his speaking engagements dried up. Um, there was a six month investigation uh, of his uh, work by the Pulitzer board conducted by an outside law firm, he was exonerated. MIT, where he teaches, conducted an investigation, he was exonerated. The Boston Review, where he's a fiction editor, conducted an investigation, he was exonerated. And I don't want to sort of implicate the victim too much. Who knows what really happened? But the victim then, or the alleged victim, was, get, was quoted in an interview with the Boston Globe, refusing to say whether the kiss was on the mouth or on the cheek. So it sort of you, the, the whole the whole nature of the accused, the act of which he was accused, was was brought into question. And he was accused also uh, by other women of having created a weird feeling in them in their interactions. So. If I were, you know, accused of creating weird feelings uh, in people and my work was censored on, on that account, <laughs> I would not be up here. Um, so, but he continues to be uh, associated with something creepy. He continues, according to the person I called, he continues not to have speaking engagements. Um, and he continues to be a sort of poster child for the Me Too movement, um, when in fact I think he's the poster child for excesses of um, any movement where these accu accusations uh, are made, decisions are made, and then later, you know, sort of results come out, but they don't get the same, the same attention. Um, there's one thing, I, two things I want to pick up from you. One is where does, um, our, where do our judgments belong? I agree that we have a failed justice system, but I also think that behavior belongs in the realm of the justice system. And if we are ha unhappy with the justice system, let's fix the justice system. Let's not remove work from circulation. Um, you also mentioned celebrity, which I think is, you know, I find myself, if there's something wonderful that's coming out of the Me Too movement, it is beginning to question the cult of celebrity. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing, you know, when we were talking before uh, this panel, we talked about some things we might bring up, and one of the things we talked about was Picasso and Demoiselle d'Avignon. And, um, you know, Picasso is an artist who really profoundly cultivated the cult of genius, the cult of the self. He himself said, I, I wrote down the quote, um, it's not what the artist does that counts, but what he is. So he was very, part he participated in his own self-glorification, self-commodification. Um, and that is beginning to be questioned as a model. Cosby, you know, the Cosby show uh, has, has been, you know, Bill Cosby himself is, is, a, is a figure whose who's sort of grand stature has been questioned. Um, just to sort of um, change the subject slightly on the question of should the Cosby show continue to be shown. Uh, one thing, I do think that TV and movies present a different problem than some other, kind of other forms because they're collaborative media. So were, for example, we to take the Cosby show out of circulation, what about the astonishing career of Felicia Rashad? Are we now never gonna get to see the work she did on that show? If we take the works of Woody Allen out of circulation or you refuse to see them because of what he did, what about the extraordinary comic work of Diane Keaton, the young Diane Keaton and Mia Farrow? Are we going to, are we going to take that out of circulation too? But if we're going to question the cult of celebrity, um, and the ways in which uh, we, we exclude work by, by other people who aren't celebrities, whose work do don't command that kind of money or, or attention, um, I think that's a really 
good thing. There's a wonderful show, I don't know if you saw it, it just closed, called Posing Modernity. The, oh, yeah, I did. It's yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And what's fantastic about it is it's about the uh, artists who, artists gaze on the black female model. Um, and what's fantastic about that show is you learn that, in fact, it was not necessarily an objectifying gaze. That what's wonderful is that the models were in the same social circle, were friends, viewed themselves as collaborating to some degree in the art, and then, of course, it would be uh, hung and shown under the title of Negrest. You know, right, so, which they had to change those titles. Right, they right. changed those titles recently, but there's this whole process of collaboration that goes into the production of these paintings that gets completely elided later in the, in the exhibition. And, that, and, and this was sort of resurrecting that kind of secret history of, of that, and I thought that was fantastic. So even the seemingly most individual works of art of the individual genius are, are these very complex works. And you know, if we deconstruct the image of the genius and we start to think about how Work, works of art really are made and are not just made by male geniuses or female geniuses, but out of, come out of a cultural context and out of a process of collaboration, that would be a good, good byproduct of this. Um, I wanted to talk, one, about, um, I also feel like the way that certain things are being presented is uh, we, we're becoming uh, voyeurs. You know, um, and so that it's always like, you know, some other person and we're looking through this big lens. Um, and I think that, again, like where it becomes really important is like not looking, you know, voyeur voyeuristically, but, but basically being able to see ourselves. Right, and to see our families, and to see the way that we've been conditioned, you know, um, again around the patriarchy. And I, I was also thinking about again, you know, we're having this discussion about, you know, Me Too, and the conversation is going to the men, you know. And I, I wasn't, you know, necessarily in the beginning such a big fan of Me Too, but, uh, but basically, you know, I heard a woman say, you know, uh, my life was quietly destroyed, you know, while this guy you know, whatever ascended. And, um, and then I saw myself, and then I saw it, and I saw the ways that women are silenced. And so, um, and so the bottom line is, is that, yeah, we want it, it, we want it uh, to be in the realm of the courts, but again, uh, it's an immediate problem. It would take forever to fix the courts. And, and what do we do about this problem about women being silenced, women like not having their voices, you know, being heard? Uh, all of these discussions go into how we can, you know, whatever, fix the men, do this for the men, but but where is the place for women's voices? Where is it, where is it, where is the restorative justice for them? And one of the things that I've been thinking about is restorative justice in the sense of it would be interesting to me. Like I thought, you know, with regard to Juno, um, you know, if in fact somebody you know was accused and it was proven that they actually did something, you know, then they would have to uh, I don't know helm five books, you know, by women. Right, uh, that they would, you know, that Weinstein, you know, now has to take all of his money and make all these films by women, right, and produce them. So I, I don't know. I retribution. mean, yeah, retribution, but restorative justice. So that, like, the problem is, you know, women's voices being out, right? I mean, that's one aspect of the problem. And the other thing is, how do these men get punished? You know, where is the accountability, right? But, um, but I do think, you know, rather than just like, okay, put them in jail and, you know, go away forever, you know, put them on an island and set it afire. Um, like, basically, you know, they could do something in terms of, like, helping, you know, women's voices, you know, get out there. You know, I, I think the conversation is making, think, making me reflect upon the title of the session in a new way, you know, when we think about, like, the separating the dancer from the dance. In some ways, we might think about this broader moment we're, we're in as a kind of dance and, and thinking about any of these individual cases, right, as, as can we separate this individual case? Can we talk about what's going on with Juno Diaz as, as different from, like, the broader sweep where, where we've sort of, in the court of public opinion, certain individuals have been, um, um, you know, uh, uh, ostracized or or villainized in some ways. Um, in this moment, right, of, of great outrage, of this, this reckoning, I mean, even Roseanne, Roseanne is the one that comes to mind as maybe an example um, 
of, of a reckoning over race that you were talking about, Pamela, and I, we do see a little bit of that now with the kind of public conversation that's just beginning, really, uh, to get into questions about the history of minstrelsy and blackface, which has been in the news in the past week. Um, but, you know, I don't think that it, it, it's, it's, it's always, for me, when I've been following this, I'm always surprised by just how far those roots go and how many different cultural products have some kind of linkage to that era. But when I'm thinking about, okay, so we have this public realm where all of these controversies are swirling how do we think about like the college or the university as, as somewhat apart, right? So, it, it, you know, is there a role for the university or for the college art classroom to play here in, in, in um, holding the line or, or um, responding to the, this kind of swirling dance that's happening outside of it um, in a kind of different way or, or morally distinct way? Is there, is there a role here for, for higher education that's different from museums or institutions or the courts? Are there any thoughts about that question? I mean, I, I think a lot about cultural institutions in general, and uh, you know, the, the university is one of them. But, and I think we, we could talk a lot about the individual artists and so on, but um, the practical problems that we encounter in terms of censorship have to do with the institution. Uh, because there are many pressures upon institutions, art institutions, as well as uh, universities, college art museums, to, um, to choose their role in a way. To, um, because they, they say that their role is to have difficult conversations, to be a safe space for unsafe ideas. But there is this pressure for them to assert a type uh, of, of moral values, like specific moral values. So, and um, you know, we think of those moral values as good ones, but it's also the pressure to assert a type of orthodoxy. And I'm personally very wary of orthodoxies of all kinds. And, um, and I don't think that that orthodoxy is going to like, if we like remove, purge the man, the bad man, uh, and the races, are, are, is it necessarily going to lead to diversity? Is it going to lead to another type of purge? So it's a, it's a kind of uh, position of principle. Do we admit a kind of heterogeneity of ideas, a pluralism, uh, even ideas we don't like and have those conversations, both in the university, the quintessential marketplace of ideas, as the Supreme Court said, and, uh, and the museum, or do we ask those institutions to take the role of, of the justice system and distribute justice and uh, cut voices that we think are, go beyond the fail right now? Or should we, uh, should we have this conversation? And that's, I think, what kind of the, the crux of the matter is right now, the role of the institution. Um, so, I mean, to me, um, I think, you know, purging, uh, purging bad actors from institutions is only going to lead to more digging for personal sins. You know, whether as a woman you're a racist, whereas as a man you have abused women, or being a racist, like, what are your sins? Um, you know, we had, um, to give you examples, um, we have, uh, you know, Dana Schutz and we have Jodorowsky. We also have Leonard Peltier. Mm -hmm. And every time Leonard Peltier is exhibited, the FBI groups come and said, no, he killed one of ours. He's, you mm -hmm. cannot do that. You cannot give a platform to this man. And his, you know, his paintings are sort of innocuous. So you dig more for personal sense, you demand more purity, and ultimately you get more self-censorship on the part of institutions that are fearful. And what we're trying to do is give institutions the, the wherewithal to have a discussion, to not bury the issues, to talk about systematic racisms, to bring people that are not in the, muse uh, in the museum into the museum, but not do it through suppression and saying, okay, this, this goes away. Right, but it, but there's another factor in the sense that uh, the museums, if we're talking specifically about the museums, they're not uh, diversified in terms of like who's at the top, right? So already there's a censorship that like, it's like how do you have this discussion about censorship when you don't have any black people or you've just hired one woman, you know, in 2018, you know? So it's just sort of like how are we gonna have these discussions if we're not even at the table? Right. Um, so part of like the safety of having the, the, the discussions is also having representation. Right. So there's an intrinsic censorship that happens with people of color. Like one of the things I work with an organization and um, and basically their idea of like, you know, diversity is when they do a program to call up, you know, a black person. And, in, and I'm like, well, there has to be a black person at the decision making level. 
You know, it's not just to come in and to perform. Right, and so the bottom line is, is that already these institutions, you know, are failing or come in from a censored position because they don't have equity in terms of women, they don't have equity in terms of people of color, uh, they don't have equity in terms of class, and so they're, you know, so how do we, how, how, you know, does the institution, you know, become this yardstick or this measuring stick for, for what is correct and what is morally right and all of that when, when in, intrinsically, and I mean, again, that comes back to this patriarchal capitalist system that it's already, uh, you know, compromised. Does the college or the university have a unique role to play in fixing those? Well, I mean, that's a problem of the university as well, right? You know, it's like, okay, the only black teacher who's diversifying, you know, the, the syllabus. You know, I mean, one of the radical things that I do is put, like, all women or put, like, all people of color on a syllabus, you know? And I mean, that in itself is radical, right? Um, so, I mean, again, we have to fix things within the system. I mean, the college can do, you know, so much, but until they address, like, diversity, you know, themselves, or, again, like, the, the pay discrepancy between women and men, I mean, again, like, that whole system, we've been corrupted by, by um, patriarchy. Um, so I wasn't, because this is a college art association panel, I was thinking in terms of artists, not universities, but I'm going to, give an example that actually is applicable to universities or by analogy. So I was thinking of Chuck Close, who has been accused of, you know, uh, sexual misconduct in the sense of uh, asking women to pose, who are his peers, who are artists, to pose for him either topless or nude and, and, and commenting on their bodies in incredibly inappropriate ways. And there were, after these accusations, there were three responses, um, one by a university. Seattle University Library removed an artwork that they, they had hanging on the wall. The National Gallery postponed an exhibition. And the, Penn, uh, the Pennsylvania, I think it's the Academy of Fine Arts, if I get that wrong, correct me, left an exhibition up, but added a show of women artists and gave viewers uh, post-it notes to sort of make, to post next to the works to express their views. So obviously you have the, right, you have the, the, the suppression model. Uh, you know, you, you take something down, you don't allow something to go up, or you add more. And so I think, you know, obviously uh, in a university, obviously you're always in when creating syllabuses and create, you're, you're implicitly in creating, creating canons, people will be excluded. But rather than taking away pe the people who instigate interesting, important, necessary conversations, as Svetlana says, you just add more. You add more speech. There's bad speech, you add more speech. You correct it with more speech. And to go to your excellent, excellent point, mm -hmm. once you start adding more diversified exhibitions, syllabi, et cetera, you have to hire the people who can produce them. Because you know they just simply you can't you just simply can't ask a white man to actually uh, with no experience put together uh, I mean you can and some will be able to but on the whole as an institution once you decide you want to diversify you're going to hire have to hire the kind of people who know about that work and not to be essentialist about it but it does tend to be the individuals of the, that color and of that of that sex so uh, you know I think I think anyway I think it carries over. Can I add one more sure, thing? Yeah. Um, there's also you know, like something here in the sense that um, I wrote a, a poem uh, about Me Too, and it's actually about being abused by women, right? Um, and so in that regard, that's a whole other, like, you know, can of something, right? Um, it's a different dance. Right. So how do, how do, we, how do we talk about that, right? Um, because, I mean, again, like, there's this... Uh, uh, there's this idea that it's men who sort of like, you know, do this and, and they've been emboldened in this, this culture to do that. But then again, women have ingested the patriarchy and so we're enacting violence against each other. And where does that, where does that conversation come in? I mean, and it seems to me, this is not about um, our biologies and our skin color, it's about power. And you know, when you look at where the abuses come from, they come from whoever's in power. Uh, and is it, uh, do we have a guarantee that if women are in power, 
they're not going to have uh, to, to be abusive if you have the same systems of power and, and, and power that's, discrepancies. Right. Right. That's mm -hmm. why celebrity matters. That's why right. exactly. So we want to bring, matters. I mean, we, you want to have a kind of like to change the structure of power, yeah. not to um, move the people, because that's not going to change the structures. But, but how do we, I mean, this is a question that came from the audience that applies here, you know, how do we set a, a new standard then in thinking about future works if we, if we don't hold past works to the same standard? You know, is that going to be possible? Um, you know, uh, basically, uh, there, is, there is so much grotesque, you know, uh, misbehavior in the history of art that, you know, are we going to pull the works of uh, Cellini? Are we going to pull, I, I made a little list, you know, of the, of the infamous artists, you know, Caravaggio, you know, you know them, right? Caravaggio, Egon Schiele, uh, convicted of statutory rape, you know, Edward Muybridge, convicted of murder. Um, are we going to, are we going to pull these works? Um, and if we don't pull these works right, are we going to pull the works of people who also have committed egregious acts? Um, I would argue that we should not. Um, we can create standards of behavior and enforce them in the realm of behavior, but not enforce them. We, we should not censor the realm of the imaginary. That's, that's my hardline position on that. But that doesn't mean that we should not be talking about these or right. recontextualizing the work and uh, bringing those up. So yes. I think part of the problem was sweeping all this under the table and it's like, okay, you have a great artist and then we don't look at the rest. You look at the rest. We are looking at the rest, but uh, without removing the work. We just add to the conversation yes. and complexify. You know, artists are not angels. They're, they're messy people like all of us. And, um, you know, holding artists to this kind of, you know, very, very high moral standard, what is going to be left? And also, it's, it's, it, art is about that. It is about human complexity. Um, so, you know, you need to, uh, uh, you, you cannot like purge things and not even try to understand somebody who has transgressed moral codes because then you just like, you have a prohibition to think. You have to be thinking about those issues. Um, one of the things that I think is important right now is consciousness raising, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's something that, that even before the like Me Too movement, like in the classroom, I would you know, talk about contemporary music in the roles of women in music. And you know, and it was kind of funny in the sense that, you know, I was like reciting, you know, lyrics by Eminem and all these different people. And I'm like, you know, yeah, you kill her dead, you murder her, you, you know, jump off the whatever, the bridge with her, my gang got her, and like dance, 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 right? And um, and you know, the students were always like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> and um, I, they thought I was like very like serious, but um, but they thought it was funny, but they'd never even thought about it. You know, we've been so conditioned to just kind of like go along and go along. I think, you know, that's something that the university can do, you know, is begin to like just talk about these roles. Like I think like one of the answers, you know, to this is a radical re-education of all genders in our school systems, right? Um, so anyway, so I think that, that that will very much impact our future you know, in terms of how we look at art, in terms of, you know, uh, what artists do and make and, and the response. Yeah. Right, and perhaps contribute to breaking down some of the barriers you were talking about before. Um, I'm thinking also here about this question. So if we put, a, put aside for a minute the artists, they're able to be off in the marketplace of artistry, in the realm of the imaginary, they produce whatever they want, uh, there are no morals, there are no rules. But for curators or you know, professors, universities, cultural institutions, is there a kind of level of um, responsibility to which they should be held? Do they have you know, a role to play in, in educating people? And this is this, this classic question, right? If we're going to present you know, Chuck Close or, or Roseanne, you know, can you imagine you're watching Roseanne and it begins with a, an asterisk statement you know, before you, you watch the show or something like that? Well, I'm, I'm not a fan. Uh, I understand the asterisk, but I think, I think any trigger warning, I'm not a fan of trigger warnings either. Um, and the problem is, the reason is I think that first you have to encounter the work. And if you, if you privilege the sexual uh, behavior uh, of, a, um, of a writer or the misbehavior of a writer, uh, or if you privilege, even if you privilege the racial or sexual 
content of the work, you predispose the student or the reader to a particular kind of reading. Later, when you, if you're teaching it, right, then, or if you're like me, anytime you read anything, you sort of formulate your opinion and then you go read every single thing you can get your hands on that other people have written about it, then you begin to consider these sort of outside considerations. But I do, I am a new critic and I am a postmodernist in the sense that I do believe there's an encounter with the text, mm -hmm. which if you start to frame it, pre-frame it, mm -hmm. then you will always produce, it's a self-perpetuating cycle, you will always produce the reading that is about the sexual behavior or the sexual content or the and so on and so forth. Now, I understand that the trigger warning is helpful in terms of creating a sense of inclusiveness, you know, pre-acknowledging that some people have been excluded from the discussion and may be made uncomfortable. I think rather than trigger warnings, what you need are more classes, more diversity in the syllabus, um, as I've said, more speech, not predetermining N not just less speech, but not predetermining how the speech is going to be taken. So the, the curator here isn't different from the artist, in the sense. The curator, um, uh, hmm. you mean in other words, should, should well, you? Well, it seems like what you're saying is that the curator doesn't really, you know, the curator should be free to put it together in the same way that shouldn't be involved in pre-framing it. Uh, in asterisking. It, well, I guess uh, I was thinking more like the, 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 the teacher. But, you know, I think that you can bring in the biographical. I think if you want to be a curator who privileges the biographical above everything else, I would disagree with you. The curator has the right to do that. The curator has uh, the right to frame speech any way they want. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they should privilege the biographical above everything else. Or else, why are they showing it? Unless they specifically, the show is specifically about this question. Um, I just wanted to bring up, uh, I guess, a while back when when Kara Walker first, uh, you know, surfaced. Um, basically, a lot of like uh, black artists had a huge issue um, with her work, and uh, which I find problematic. But then on another level, I understand um, in the sense that. They were concerned about representation, that the work that of black artists that were getting shown were basically, um, you know, were showing kind of like pathological aspects of like sexuality, right? Um, and then again, it goes back to the Dana Schutz thing about what actually gets shown, right? Um, and so I think like curators, I think they have to, like again, I think the idea of diversity and having balance in terms of what is shown Right, so if you only have one, you know, person of color who's being shown, and like, and and basically they're doing stuff. I mean, it happens in the movies too. You know, it's like, okay, now we're doing the slave dramas, and there's again, it's all these like pathological aspects of of black life, which are really, really important. But where's the diversity in terms of like what's being shown? The basic storyline, yeah. right? Sure. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I work a lot with like curators curating difficult content, and I think uh, that there's no one one solution. It has to be very much considered on a case by case basis. And you know, with the Danish shoots, the curators added uh, more text to the wall label uh, when the controversy erupted, kind of explaining the motivation of the artist. Would you necessarily do that every time? Probably wouldn't. Uh, my friend Julia here has worked with. Um, a museum of uh, the work of Eric Gill, who is a British artist who is kind of very high profile. He has work in Westminster Cathedral. He also sexually abused his daughter. <laughs> uh, so there was a museum about him. And how do you present, how do, do, do you talk about that or not? And uh, the museum in that case went through long conversations with other practitioners in the field. There needs to be a lot of thought to see how to frame the work whether to bring those issues, how to bring them in. Uh, but yes, of course, labeling, if you just say, oh, you know, check clothes, well, asterisks, he's, you know, he did that to women. That, that's really, uh, like, is that what you want to bring from this biography? Is it another thing? How do you bring that in? And I think kind of like the post-it, like people responding when you have a life controversy, uh, people's uh, bringing in not just a curator, bringing in audience responses uh, could be very productive. Uh, but th this is not kind of an easy, 
either or answer, but it does put a lot of burden on curators today when these issues are emerging and actually kind of we do have more diversity, we do have more conversations, and the protests have actually contributed to those conversations, which is why we, we really support the protests in all of these cases, not the suppression, but the protests. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a moment when curators have a very important cultural role to play in how they present this work. And of course, the easy solution is just cancel it. Uh, but it is not good for the culture, not good for diversity, not good for anything. This is another question from the audience, um, which is, you know, we've been talking about artists and then curators, but then what also of, of funders of art and whether they become morally corrupt? Is, is there a, um, a need to reckon with uh, uh, that realm as well? Well, Nan Golden, right? She was just at the Guggenheim, and was she protesting the Sacklers? Yeah. Right. The Met too. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, the Met, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, and the Guggenheim. The yeah, yeah, right. Um, I'm not going to comment on that. I, I want to see, because I, I have a particular... Let me check with my funders. Yeah, Wait, are, are, yeah. I'm not sure which question you're asking. Are you saying, um, should the funders endorse by funding uh, artists who, are, who have problematic behavior? Or are you saying, should we reject the funding of problematic funders? We could, we could ask either question. What, what do, you, do you have a thought on either one? Um, whew, I don't know. I, I, I would basically say, um, as long, so it's interesting. My husband was involved in a for, uh, founding a First Amendment Institute at Columbia in, that took money from the Koch brothers and balanced it by taking money from, from a group, I've forgotten which group, oh, the Pew Foundation, that was, you know, sort of is, is really in a very different space from the Koch brothers. And um, you had to say, without the money, there would have been no First Amendment center. Um, so I think that you have, to, you can take the money, but you have to problematize where it comes from. And, and it, it can be, like with the Sacklers, it can be uh, an occasion to educate the public. Um, um, in terms of funding, I, I don't, I haven't thought about the question of should you fund the more, I guess I would say you probably, I don't know. I don't know whether you should fund the criminally, the criminally reprehensible artist. That's a, that's a, that's a question I haven't really thought about. Um, but I do think to go back to the question of institutions, you do have the problem of who makes the decision and why. I've thought a whole lot more about literature than I have about art. That's why I'm having a problem with the funding question. But I do know that, for example, when um, publishing companies decide to adopt morality clauses or publishing companies decide not to publish controversial artists, the publishers, the editors, may not be making those decisions. Editors, I think of as people of basically goodwill and integrity. Um, who often have to publish crappy commercial work but try to publish good work as well. Um, but the decisions are really coming down from uh, really on high, and I don't know if people realize how far on high, because most of these publishing companies are owned by these international conglomerates, which include all kinds of things, you know, Hachette owns, you know, manufactures weapons as well as publishing books, you know. Uh, a lot of them do entertainment, um, which and a kind of entertainment that's purely commercially driven. So the decisions are not being made on a moral basis. They're being entirely made on a commercial basis. And um, so I think empowering th those to make the decisions and giving it a sort of moral cover, right? You have an artist who's too controversial to sell, so they pull the book. Um, that's, that, could, that, could, that could go way beyond Me Too into a lot of very problematic uh, uh, objections. So that's sort of the realm in which I've thought about this. Um, I did think about it a little bit in the sense that, um, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying it, but, um, but there are certain protests that I look at as protests of like white entitlement. And, um, and basically the funding issue becomes that for me. Um, I think what Nan is doing is brilliant, but I also think that, like, you know, people of color have a different kind of position, you know, and we want to get into the museum. So, you know, so basically, 
the first thing that we look at is not necessarily going to be the funding. Like I had a student, um, a white student, who is teaching in uh, the Chicago public schools. And basically, uh, she ended her day with calling everybody. She called like her bosses. She called the, you know, she called everybody, you know, and said like, I mean, the, the they didn't leave a lesson plan for her, that some of the kids couldn't read, that like, in, in, in any way they dismissed her, you know, and they said, okay, you got to go, right? And um, um, and like these things were shocking to her, and uh, and I said, you know, you're not going to change that. You know what I mean? The, the bottom line is you have to like go and you have to like you know bring the work. But I thought it was interesting the level of like outrage that she had, right? And that's definitely informed by race and by class. You know what I mean? So. Well, I mean, with the the funding issue, I think there's kind of some times. Uh, I love the, the the protests, and I think protests are great because they they bring attention to those issues. But in terms of an institution removing bad funding, I mean, you look at the money. If you pursue the money far enough, uh, probably all our retirement funds are somewhere invested in something that's like it's connected to the prison system, big money maker, guns. Uh, or pharmaceuticals. So, you know, the Met was considering their Saudi funding. Now there's the Sackler. So uh, kind of looking at this, well, let's, let's just admit we live in a capitalist economy where, where art is dependent on money of all sorts. And I think when your mission is going to be uh, compromised by a funder, when, you know, the Cokes are on the board of the Museum of Natural History or the Mercers, th there's more of a kind of potential a conflict where you know the program of the institution could be compromised, uh, but if you if you uh, if you have like a separation between the money and the program, and your program is not affected by the money, how do you begin to to pick and choose when you know those institutions are dependent on that? And there's the other issue here which we haven't mentioned, which is public funding. You know, uh, if you don't want the private companies with their uh, tainted money to fund the arts. Where is the public funding? The public funding is diminishing, leaving the arts to, to private money. And then, of course, private money is made in uh, all sorts of ways. So we should be talking about these issues, uh, but removing the Sacklers, or like an individual, or, or what was the name of the guy on the board of the Whitney, who uh, has the Fairland, the company producing um, the, the gas that is used on the border. Uh, so you remove these people, so what? You're going to certainly, suddenly exit the economy and be in a, in a different plane of virtue, of, of virtue. That would be, to me, very hypocritical. R address it, be aware of it, uh, but not uh, you know, make those symbolic gestures that are meaningless. Uh, we're just about out of time, and I know we started a little late. Um, very quickly, if each of you, uh, just in closing, I thought maybe if you could give us just one quick sentence, a slogan, a statement, you know, what you think is like the key or most important thing that those who are active in the college art world think about or bear in mind when they're thinking about uh, the challenge of the morally compromised artist. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. So I came with a quote. The key. I came with a quote. Um, uh, from Marina Warner, who's uh, the president of the Royal Society of Literature in um, England. And uh, she, writing about this question of morality clauses and morality, she, she wrote, the self in the age of the selfie doesn't want to know about complicated people and contradictions. The demand for public performance, developing the brand, the likes and the retweets, it's an advertising model of the self. And writers are by tradition and vocation its instinctive and deep-rooted adversaries. The undecidability of the self, the plurality of every human being over time, has been our material and our concern ever since, oh, who shall I say, Madame de Lafayette, Euripides? Um, striving to be good is not the same as good writing. Engaging in fictive truth-telling is not the same as winning gold stars for conduct. It involves countering received ideas and refusing to conform. So um, I would say the, my final statement on this is human beings are complex. Um, we have to factor that into the production of works of art as well and our readings of works of art and our, the way in which we incorporate the biographical material of the artist into our interpretation of the work. Um, if we demand zero tolerance, um, we're going to back ourselves into corners rather like we find uh, the Democrats having done in Virginia. That's a whole other point. Um, 
Oh, it's really hard to do. But um, but I would I would basically say that uh, I would say consciousness raising, uh, education and re-education uh, around gender uh, and. Uh, what was it? Uh, well, okay, I'll say those. Uh, so consciousness raising, education, and re-education, um, those are some of the clues. Yeah. Well, I'd say, yeah, sorry, I don't have a quote, but I think um, listening across lines of disagreement, listening to those we may hate because they're on the other side of the political divide, courage, courage to, to both listen and hear uncomfortable things for all of us, and uh, the value of complexity for the university. I think this is very, very important, but it does require the courage. And um, you know, universities have to remember that this is, this is what their mandate is, to, to have those conversations, not shy away from them, because you know, feelings could be hurt, uh, and we have to listen, but not abdicate that role, and it's difficult. All right, we'll end on that. Thank you if you could join me in thanking our wonderful distinguished panelists today. And those of you, if we didn't have time for your questions, I invite you to um, ask us offline afterward. Thank you so much. Thank you.